thank God for the reading of His precious word. The Day of the Lord of Hosts is the title of our devotion this evening, taken from Isaiah chapter 2 and verses 10 to 22. Four thoughts. When God's judgment comes, verse 10. Proud men bow down, verse 11 to 18. No place to flee, verse 19 to 21. Cease ye from men, verse 22. When men disregard God's laws to destroy its foundations, there's only a fearful awaiting of judgment. Israel had been trending on that downward slope for years, but the decisive attack on the foundations of society was the disregard for God's law and God's order for that society. Hard times have indeed come upon Israel. As the prophet Isaiah observed the movement of disobeying God's laws and trend towards lawlessness have come to a head. As one pastor rightly points out, when a nation celebrates what God condemns, judgment from on high must eventually come. No one can say how or when or where that judgment will come. But as certainly as God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah, as certainly as the great empires of history have fallen, so will our nation not escape God's judgment. It is a dark day indeed when God's law in section 377A was taken down on the 29th of November 2022 in Singapore. For the people of God, we cling on to God's promise in Psalm 37 and verse 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. And fret not thyself because of Him who prospereth in His way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. We may indeed say that perilous times are upon us. 2 Timothy chapter 3. For the people of God, we take refuge in the Lord in the face of an uncertain future. As the psalmist said in Psalm 11 verse 1 and 2, In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain. For lo, the wicked bend their arrow, their bowl. They make ready their arrow upon the string that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. Perilous times. But we have a God that is above this, trusting that God can protect him. The psalmist David, flee to the Lord for refuge. We can apply this to our moral crisis here in Singapore. Only three men had the window to cast the vote courageously, truthfully and insightfully to warn of the perils to come. The people of God must not fear and the people of God must not fret. Psalm 11 verse 2 to 3 says, For lo, the wicked bend their arrow, they make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The word foundation refers to the moral and spiritual underpinnings of any society. Romans chapter 1 foresees such a day. The psalmist's spiritual response is not despondence, but to rest in the Lord. Psalm 11 verse 4. The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, His eyelids try the children of men. God is still on the throne and sovereignly ruling over the universe. He knows God's people can rest in Him by dwelling in His presence. Psalm 11 verse 5 says, The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul 
haters. It will be a time of testing to prove the people of God. And Psalm 11 verse 6 and 7 tells us of the judgment to come. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. For the righteous loveth righteousness, his countenance doth behold the upright. Our text in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 6 to 9, showed the set incursions of lawlessness in the land of Israel, which we saw last, last exhortation. A day of judgment is coming for those who mock God and reject His word. We began this second sermon of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 2. Right, we see that there are three sermons that uh, Isaiah would show us, three sample sermons in the first five chapters. In chapter 1, we saw the first. This is the second sermon that he will write. And then there is chapter 5 in the third sermon. We saw in the beginning when God rules in the millennium, He shows a picture when the swords will be beaten into plowshares, there will be true peace in Israel and the world. When God rules, when Christ, a high priest, sits in Jerusalem, in the temple in Jerusalem, to rule from Jerusalem, and the man will take hold of the skirt of a Jew and said, we want to know the living and true God. Show, show it to us. We saw the sad incursions of lawlessness in the land of Israel. And so it was, a waiting, it was an awaiting of judgment to come. Verse 10, Enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of His majesty. The nations seem to have a sense to know that the day to safety is to dig deep into the crevices of the earth and hide there from possible calamity. Isn't it so? Nations of the world would dig deep underground and deep underground store food, make shelter and do all those things. How did they understand? How did they know? Well, the Bible prophesies how foolish men, uh, how uh, men would try to escape, isn't it? From the judgment of God. Where can they go? They can't go up, so they, they crawl down. And they go underground. Build more tunnels. That's what we are seeing today, isn't it? Even in our own place here. right? That's the way to flee. That's man's wisdom. Right? But here, you see, instead of simply predicting that their sinful cause should be interrupted by a terrible manifestation of God's presence, the prophet Isaiah now views him as already come or at hand. Now, what happened? What happened? God will send the Assyrians and God will send the Babylonians upon the northern kingdom in 722 BC, and the Babylonians in 586 BC. When they come, it will be a great ravaging. God would use Nebuchadnezzar as his instruments of wrath upon his own people. And the Babylonians would come with great wrath, great power. And here, the prophet views shows us as if the Lord has already come, singling out of, or addressing the people as an individual and singling out one of the number and exhorting him to take refuge underground in the rocks. You see, in Israel, if you go to the Promised Land, you go to Palestine, you realize that it, was, it, it is a country of many caves, Many caves, right? If you uh, go to 
for example, we saw uh, in this place called Masada, and Masada, uh, very uh, rock, rock uh, 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 fortress, very, very high up. You have to take a high cable car up, and um, there, there was a last stronghold, Jewish stronghold, before the Romans built a high ram to uh, go up there. And when they went up there, they discovered that all those who were there defending that plot, they have taken their own lives. That was the last stronghold of the Jews before the Romans totally uh, overrun the land. And then there is the places near the Qumran Caves where they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, you see uh, littered along, uh, it, it is said that, you know, you look at it, it's like Edom. Edom uh, Esau's hair is red in colour, so you look at it, it's very red, very red, full of uh, red mud caves that are there. Well, um, these caves are places where uh, a man can find a, 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 a safe place to hide in the time of uh, danger. And you see this uh, in 1 Samuel 13, verse 6, in his, Israel's history. When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strict, for the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. 1 Samuel 1, 14, verse 11. And both of them discovered themselves unto the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines says, Behold, the Hebrews came forth out of the holes where they had hid themselves. Oh, there was an ambush that came. And Judges 6, verse 2, you remember, during the time of Gideon, when the Midianites plundered Israel, uh, the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because the Midianites of the Bindianites, the children of Israel, made them the dens which were in the mountains and caves and strongholds. The tone of this address is not sarcastic. Uh, Alexander Joseph Edison rightly points out. But terrific. It was a terror in which the Lord intend to show in the manifestation of His presence when judgment would come, verse 11 to verse 18, shows how the lofty looks of men shall be humbled and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. The eyes of the loftiness of men were cast down. The height or pride of men is brought low. Now, how does men pride themselves in the world today? By their status, by the way they are able to portray themselves as successful. Well, that's how the men of the world portrays themselves, isn't it? And that's the lofty look that we see in the world today. And we pray the Lord he would be gracious to help us to see, not to go after those things of the world, for at the end, we will be disappointed by them. For the day of the Lord shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty, and upon every one that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. And upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan, and upon all the high mountains, and upon all the hills that are lifted up, and upon every high tower, and upon every fenced wall, and upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon all pleasant pictures, the general threatenings of humiliation is now applied specifically to a variety of lofty objects in which people might be supposed to delight and to trust in verses 12 to 16. And you would 
see here how uh, verse 11 tells us that there is a day that the Lord of hosts will come, an appointed time for the manifestation of His power. You see, when God doesn't do anything, uh, we think that, you know, nothing happens. Uh. Ah, he, he is asleep. No, he's not asleep. When you see nothing, dear friends, uh, be very silent and be very prayerful. You don't know when the Lord will act. And when he acts, well, we see that it will be a humbling time. The day of the Lord, a day he has appointed, the day that he has reserved. And so we said in Psalm 37, that helps us to understand and see and be aware that we be not on the wrong side. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Fret not thyself because of Him who prospereth in His way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evil doers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek, those who do the will of God, those who obey his law, those who uphold his standards by his grace, shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plotteth against the just and gnashes upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy and to slay such as of an upright conversation. An upright conversation. We have an idea of what is an upright conversation in the, in the last three days, isn't it? What is an upright conversation? Ah, it, the Lord shows us. And it is for us to see. Why did He choose to allow these things? It's for us to see. For us to distinguish what is good and what is evil. And for us to realize that indeed we are living in perilous times. The wicked have drawn out the sword, bent their bow, Cast down the poor and needy. Their sword shall enter into their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholdeth the righteous. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright. Their inheritance shall be forever. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke. Shall they consume away? Depart from evil, do good, and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loveth judgment, and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom, and his tongue talketh of judgment. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slight. The wicked watches the righteous and seeketh to slay him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand, nor condemn him when he is judged. Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exhort thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself with like a green bay tree. Yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. But the transgressors shall be destroyed together, and the end of the wicked shall be 
cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. The Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in Him. Psalm 37. So we see here that when the Lord acts, the movement that He makes, what does He do? Well, the prophet Isaiah described the lofty, the idea of lofty and imposing objects. The prophet makes use of not of symbols, but specimens from the, among the things that his readers are familiar with. What are those? Well, he began with the two of the most, uh, the noblest species of the forest trees, the cedars of Lebanon, those that were in the white mountain, the chain that was dividing Palestine from Syria, and the oaks of Bashan, a mountainous district on the east of Jordan, famous for its pastures and oak trees. Cedars and oaks are supposed to be named as emblems of great men, as it were. The trees and the hills, he now adds, walls and towers, a third class which shows the idea of loftiness and strength, isn't it? How does uh, uh, man uh, in his initial ways exhort himself? You remember when Enoch built the city? Uh, what did he do? Well, he, he, he built a city and then what did man do? He built a tower, isn't it? Yeah. All the way to heaven. If they can, it shows their might. So whenever man seeks to build a tower, you know, ah, that, well, he's, uh, he's going the way of Enoch, the evil Enoch, the way of Cain. And you see here, these are the very uh, images that Isaiah used to describe the loftiness and strength that is associated with it, isn't it? Well, I work in this place, the high tower, the best place uh, in town. Well, this is what Isaiah was describing for us. And upon every high tower, upon every fence wall, literally was cut off rendered inaccessible by being fortified. The prophet now concludes his catalogue of lofty, conspicuous objects by adding, first as a specific item, maritime vessels of the largest class. Big ships, big luxury cruise liners, summing up the, in one descriptive phrase, as things attractive, Things that is imposing upon the eyes, upon all ships of Tarshish, that is able to navigate all of the Mediterranean Sea. Well, he uses these images uh, to show forth man's lofty ambitions, isn't it? And as a principle, uh, maritime trade, the Hebrews were very well aware of these things. Right, the ships from Tarsish, they would bring all uh, the rich uh, items uh, from afar. To suppose a direct allusion either to commercial wealth or naval strength, well, is it like that? Uh, well, it's an idea that is alluded to here in this text. The lofty the loft and imposing objects, the cedars, the oaks, the mountains, the hills, the towers, the walls, the ships, the attractive, the majestic objects, they shall be taken down, bowed down. And the loftiness of men shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day and the idols shall be utterly abolished. Isn't it? Uh, what is man's greatest idol? 
well, those things of this world that he coveteth after, isn't it? Those things that he prides himself to have, well, this is uh, given here as a description of what the Lord will bring down. And the haughtiness of men shall be made low. You remember Solomon in his latter days, in the chapter 12, right, he exhorts the young man, remember thy creator in the days of thy youth. Then he described the old man, uh, his teeth uh, almost falling off, uh, he cannot chew, uh, he goes up the height, he's very fearful uh, because uh, that's old age. Uh, that's old age. And uh, weakness of the body. And he tells us that indeed uh, a time will come when we can walk with God no more. And verse 11, he repeats again in verse 17, to bring us back to the details of what he was speaking about, to illustrate, to enforce, to show how the lofty men shall be cast down. The pride of men shall be brought low. And the Lord alone be exalted. So will sing the loftiness of men and bows the pride of men. And the Lord alone is exalted in that day. Verse 18. And the idols he shall utterly abolish. To the humiliation of all lofty things, the prophet now adds the entire disappearances Disappearance of their idols. The idols would be holy, pass away. The brevity of this verse right, is in contrast right, to all those things that he described. Right? It's as if all those things that they were seeking for, all those things that seem so good, seem so worthy of our... Uh, Pursuit, now these idols, they, it's no use to them. The idols he shall utterly abolish. In other words, when they are fleeing for their lives, what is the use of all these things to them? When they would lose their life, what is the use of all these things to us? And the Lord seeks for us to see, helps us to understand in perspective so that we will not be caught up and be lost in our pursuit. Well, that was what happened, isn't it? Before Sodom and Gomorrah was, were destroyed. Only one man left in that city. Only one man left in that city. And he didn't want to go. He loved it. That's how powerful it is, the idol of covetousness. But when the judgment comes, there will be no place to flee, verse 19 to 21. And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord and for the glory of His majesty. When He arises to shake terribly the earth, in that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which he, he, they made each one for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats. They are already in the caves. So what do you find in the caves? The moles and the bats. Right? <laughs> All the dirty things. Right? And what use have we of those idols in those times of where we are fleeing for our lives? No use. Right? So we cast them away to go into the clefts of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged, rugged rocks for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of His majesty, when He arises to shake terribly the earth. This verse differs 
from the 10th only by substituting a direct prediction for a warning, Edison tells us, or exhortation, by adding the design of God's terrible appearance. And they, the idolaters, shall enter into the caves of the rocks and into the holes of the earth. Because we have so much at stake, isn't it? So much at stake of the things of this world. The earth given here is the dust that was given there in verse 10. The solid surface rather than the crumbling particles called dust. And here you see the amplification, how the idols would disappear, being thrown away in haste, in terror, in shame, in desperate con contempt by those who had worshipped them and trusted in them. Dumb idols they are, as they escape from the judgment of God, the avenging presence of the Lord, when the brimstone would begin to fall. In that days shall man cast his idols of silver and gold, idols of gold. Here he, well, he describes for us earlier what are all those things, isn't it? which you have made for him to worship to the moles and to the bats, the ideas made for them, the idols made for them to worship, they had to cast to the moles and the bats. In a literal sense, they described dark and filthy places that they were in. And then to continue the sentence, he declares the end. As these idols were thrown away, casting them off as worthless encumbrances, isn't it? The day when we would uh, take our last breath, right? we realize that we would leave this world as it were, naked we came, naked we go. What a reality for us to see to go into the clefts of the rocks, into the dish shows of the clefts, to escape from the terror of the Lord. Here is amplified for us in the text. Verse 17. Cease ye from men. Cease ye from men whose breath is in the nostrils, for therein is he accounted of. Having predicted that the people would soon lose their confidence in their idols. Do we still have our idols? Do we still love them? Are we still uh, mesmerized by them? Well, let us not. Because soon we would realize that they are indeed very useless. We would be disappointed. He now shows the folly of transferring that confidence to human patrons. Speaking of man's weakness, mortality. Cease ye from men. Cease to trust him or depend on him whose breath is in his nostrils. Solomon spoke in his concluding thought in Ecclesiastes to come back to God, to serve Him in the time of our youth. A time comes when we can walk with Him no more. A time of judgment is coming. Let it be a judgment for reward. May the Lord be gracious to help us. Let us pray. Father, we thank Thee for Thy mercy. Strengthen Thy people to understand Thy good will and see the signs of the times and be, may thou be merciful to open the eyes of thy people to see the truth and to be escaped from the deception.
that is around us. Strengthen thy people. This I pray with thanksgiving. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.